states and 10 federally recognized tribes. Uh, certainly in Connecticut, the tribes are the Mashantucket, Pequot, and the Mohicans. Um, but other, and then we work with all 10 federally recognized tribes across New England. And so that's really an important part of the work that people often don't realize that EPA does. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about our big picture missions and then also about Connecticut and what were some of the issues in Connecticut that might be relevant to your region. Um, so as you know, we have an acting administrator of the EPA, acting administrator Wheeler, and uh, he has um, some of the same priorities that, that were carried forward from Administrator Pruitt's tenure because they are the priorities of the administration largely, which is to provide more certainty to the public and the regulated community in how EPA interacts with uh, people that transact with the agency. So being a very transparent federal agency, transparency benefits not only uh, a company that might want a permit or um, authorization to take some sort of action, but also transparency benefits environmental groups, um, citizens, anyone who wants to know what we're doing, they can see that. So I think transparency is very important to recognize it, it benefits everyone that interacts with the governmental system. So very much trying to be more transparent and more certain. More certainty comes forward in the sense of decision making. So in environment, it can often be really difficult to make a decision. We have lots of competing factors. We have sometimes a desire for economic growth. We might have a stressed ecosystem. We have maybe neighbors to that location that are concerned about what might happen. And when you put all those factors together, there's frequently some paralysis around what to do in that ecosystem or in that neighborhood or that industrial setting. So a lot of what we're trying to do is actually figure out what are the decisions that have to be made, include people in those decisions, but not be afraid to make decisions, um, good science-based decisions. So you'll see that in Connecticut in some of our work around um, the Raymark cleanup site in Stratford, which is on our Superfund priority list. There are four sites in New England that, that the um, agency has prioritized for spotlight action. And our desire there at, at Raymark specifically is to be fully inclusive with the community on the next phase of the consolidation remedy there. Um, you might know what we're doing at the Raymark site, which is that you know, the, the um, Raymark breaking company mm -hmm. had uh, placed their waste um, throughout the community as fill. Um, it largely contained asbestos and other heavy metals. There was a first phase of cleanup done um, that did not receive the best public feedback in terms of- Are you talking about the shopping center? Yes. So the, the, the end result was a success. The process of getting there, what we had heard was that the community felt that um, EPA did not engage them enough in when the work would be done, how the work would be done, things like how noisy would the work be? How many trucks would be coming through their community? So fast forward to what we launched this summer, early this summer, I was with Mayor Hoydick and um, Commissioner Rob Klee, and we launched the next phase of what we're calling the consolidation remedy. But it took us, I think there's been about 12 to 13 years since the first phase of the cleanup. So in that period of time, we've worked closely with the community, with the mayor, to the very first thing we're doing that we started this summer is building a noise barrier wall so I think that shows the, the evolution of how EPA does our work in communities where we're much more sensitive to the fact that, yes, we're trying to clean up an environmental hazard, but we're also realizing that we're doing this work in places where people live, work, and play, and call home. And we have to coexist during the cleanup as well as with that neighborhood. So we're building a noise barrier wall this summer that started. We also are building what's called a hauling road, which limits the amount of truck traffic through non-traditional truck routes. So through, we're gonna make sure that that hauling road is a temporary structure to make sure that all the movement of waste through that community is concentrated in a particular place that's the least disruptive to the neighborhood. So I'm, I'm flagging the work at the Rainmark site as an example of how um, we at EPA and, and I personally, as someone who's taught environmental justice at three different law schools and very passionate about community engagement um, are really trying to reflect the importance of EPA working in 
coordination and collaboration with communities and the state mayors and citizens not working in opposition to them as best possible. So that's a particular site here in, in Connecticut that we're excited about making progress on. Um, Can I ask you a question? Oh, about, of course. About that? It's, it, it seems like you made common sense decisions. Why did it take 13 years to put up a noise barrier and to get trucks to come in and out? I mean, these seem like a lot more than 13 years. It, I think Just, it, I, I don't like 20 years. Yeah. Like 20, okay. But why? It, the way it was explained to me was when EPA finished the first phase of the project, the, the sentiment in the community was um, we don't want EPA back for a while because it had been so disruptive and um, left people feeling disengaged. So there probably were lots of other factors that took the time period, but um, where, where, where I'm picking up the story is a very positive place. And I, I would think if you wanted to find out more about sort of how people felt about the first phase of the cleanup, there are some of the same residents who lived through that first phase of the cleanup that I've had the chance to meet a few of them at, at a couple of meetings, and um, they're they're. I think they really appreciate the direction that we're taking now. And it, it I think it's an evolution of EPA understanding how we do our work, which is it has to be in concert with the people that are affected by our work. Yeah. Thanks. So so a few other um, things we're working on that are relevant to Connecticut. Certainly the cleanup of the Long Island Sound which is um, impaired for nitrogen runoff. This is a very, very important watershed for New England, for the state of Connecticut and for the state of New York. So we're working very, very closely with our um, sister region of the EPA, which is EPA region two, which is based in New York City. That EPA region has uh, New York, New Jersey, and then they have the Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands uh, also. And we have Connecticut and New England. So this requires us to work together. So actually on Monday of this week, uh, Sean and I and our uh, Long Island Sound team were in New York City meeting with the, our colleagues in New York who are their Long Island Sound team to make sure that we could um, set some pretty aggressive goals for moving forward around the, the cleanup of the sound. There are lots of parties very engaged in this process. A lot of research being done by different academic institutions, by New York City itself, by Suffolk County, New York, as well as in Connecticut, research being done by all the shoreline communities and Connecticut Deep. We want to um, try to bring all that science together so we can make some of the best decisions we can around the cleanup of the sound. Nitrogen is not something that is quickly reversed. Uh, it's a problem that, that actually continues because it comes from runoff, from streets, from agricultural activities, anywhere that, um, that fertilizers are being used and so forth. So we, uh, it also comes from sewage treatment plants. Uh, so we really want to look very closely. We're looking at the whole watershed um, to see if we can focus on, um, on getting that sound in a, in a better place. So I'll just keep going until yep. you want to interrupt me. No, <laughs> yeah. I, so um, I would like to hear um, a little bit about how um, the president's environmental policies <laughs> um, <laughs> would um, impact your work and some of the concerns that um, have come up in Connecticut, you mm -hmm. know, for instance, in terms of um, carbon emissions and mm -hmm. how you're um, dealing with, you know, or, or communicating with and working with governors and other elected officials mm -hmm. um, in light of concerns about the president's um, mm -hmm. environmental policies. So it, when you think about um, levels of government, there are all different places that activity takes place. So the president has some priorities. They include you know, withdrawal from the climate accord in Paris, also include um, priorities that are being carried out by EPA Act Administrator Wheeler, such as revisiting the Clean Power Plan, uh, which was uh, the prior administration's effort to uh, create a carbon budget, essentially, for every state in the country, um, as well as revisiting a significant rulemaking over waters of the United States, which is a uh, which waters are have state jurisdiction primarily and which waters have federal jurisdiction. So I, I, I'll leave those three as, as 
large presidential policies that are, um, and then I'll tell you how they're impacting New England. So um, the Clean Power Plan is uh, something that there were states in the country, at least half of them, that ended up suing the EPA over the Clean Power Plan. But the New England states had sued in favor of the Clean Power Plan. New England states liked the Clean Power Plan because they have, um, we have here, um, REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is one of the first carbon trading marketplaces in the world. And if the New England states have already begun for years. I think Reggie just celebrated its 10th anniversary. The New England states have recognized climate, sea level rise, and carbon as a problem and have already determined how they're going to work on it. So this is an example where the change at the federal level will not directly impact the states of New England because there's already a collaborative relationship between the New England states on reducing carbon. Um, another example is um, whether we're working on climate change issues at the EPA. And in New England, um, as we see a storm coming up the coast just today, in New England, every one of our states, whether they are a Republican governor or a Democratic governor, have told the EPA that climate change is a priority for them. That's Governor Baker in Massachusetts. It's Governor Raimondo in, in um, Rhode Island. It's Governor Molloy here in Connecticut. It's also um, the Governor Sununu up in, in um, New Hampshire. So uh, we have many coastal states here. And these states have seen the effect of sea level rise and are seeing deteriorating coastline. So in EPA New England, what we are working on is a, a proactive agenda with our communities and states on climate and resilience work. So we have just finished distributing some of our infrastructure dollars. We're working with many coastal communities across New England that have wastewater treatment or water treatment at the coastline. Um, you might have seen that in preparation for this hurricane, we started looking at Superfund sites or any toxic sites that might be in a flood zone along the area. So recognizing the impacts of extreme weather and sea level rise is something that we are doing in New England because it is uh, a part of living here and coexisting in a, in a very coastally dominated ecosystem. So, so what we're working on climate and we've had communities come to us after the nor'easters earlier this winter um, asking if EPA has um, experts who could assist them in doing some climate and resilience planning. And we have those resources. We have a climate um, and energy division at EPA New England that is available to assist communities as they ask for help. And I say communities because frequently those requests come from localities who, who would like some one-on-one -on -one mentoring on how to prepare for future extreme weather. And then I guess on waters of the United States, that also has um, had about half the states in the country sue over the rule and half the states in the country sue in support of the regulation. Once again, this is one where the New England states were in support of the regulation because the New England states have a generally very broad definition of waters of the state. And they um, include many types of waters that they protect. And so the change of the, what the federal definition is does not have a huge impact on the New England states because they're already protecting those waters. So I like to say that in New England, um, you take that president's agenda and then you apply it in different parts of the country and it has different effects in different parts of the country. Um, what we're trying to focus on is being really practical, being very um, collaborative, um, and bringing the resources of the federal government, which we have, and our, our um, and the authorities that we have, to complement the work of our states. And um, some of those larger policy issues, um, they are uh, making headlines, you know, all over the country. But here in New England, there's just a very practical approach to moving forward. So it sounds like what you were saying was that the the New England states can continue to regulate um, at a deeper level. And um, you know, have the ability to protect things um, that go go deeper than the federal policy. States have always had that authority, and it's the sort of the cornerstone of our government that states can be more. Uh, 
strict strict than the federal government. And in New England, it's um, a place where across the states and particularly here in Connecticut, there's an extremely strong environmental ethic. It's literally embedded in how people think. Um, I like to tell people that um, I used to work for all 50 states um, in an organization in Washington that represented all 50 state environmental divisions. So all 50 state peaks, essentially. Although um, Connecticut is one of the few that puts energy and environment in the same agency, once again, making it unique, um, recognizing the intersection between environment and energy in one place. Um, but when I worked with all 50 states, um, I really became sensitive to the fact that having a conversation about environmental protection is very different in some Midwestern states or some far Western states than it is in, say, the Southeast or even in, in New England. In New England, the conversation is, is generally not whether we're going to protect the environment, it's how we're gonna protect the environment, with what resources, and it may involve who should be doing the work. Is it the state, is it the locality, is it the federal government, is it some combination, is it the private sector? But you almost start the conversation from the, the fact that there's already agreement that there's a problem, as opposed to having to establish that there's a problem and then move from there. And sometimes it takes a long time to even establish that there's a problem. What state in the United States doesn't believe that there's a problem with climate and the environment? Well, I think it's um, they may it may not be that they don't recognize climate, but I think that they um, think about how um, it impacts them within their borders. So I'll give you a, an example of a state like Wyoming, which um, the governor has come out and addressed climate directly, but Wyoming produces forty percent of the nation's coal. And so that state has a very different relationship with coal than a New England state. Um, and so it's more about the conversation there might be more about the fact that coal is a huge part of the economy of that state. And so making changes around carbon can also affect the economy of the state in a very direct way. When you come over here to Connecticut, I don't think Connecticut is a large coal producing state. And so making changes around carbon and, and fossil fuels doesn't directly impact the economy in um, Connecticut in the same way that it would in, in Wyoming. Yeah, so I would say just a couple, I wanna keep um, an eye on the time. Oh, we're almost at half an hour. So, so I wanna make sure you have a chance to ask anything else, but I would say the, the parting focus is um, protecting children from lead exposure. This is something that um, we are working towards a federal agreement across the federal agencies around different authorities to protect childhood exposure to lead. EPA has a mission of both environmental protection and public health protection. The Flint crisis last maybe two years ago um, raised, I think, the um, consciousness of all Americans that we have uh, lead in, in many parts of our um, physical environment that we interact with as people every day. So it's either in our pipes, um, it's in here in New England, uh, we have some of the oldest housing stock in the nation. Most of it is considered if it's pre-1950 housing, it's largely presumed to have a significant amount of lead-based paint in the homes. So we are working very much, actually our first lead initiative started over a decade ago in New Haven, where we did a lot of work around um, training contractors who are removing paint from homes, making sure that the lead paint jobs are conducted safely, so if they're not conducted properly, you can end up increasing lead in the environment. And this is happening where? It's, yeah. a, it's a very bad problem in New Haven. It's a very it's bad problem. It's still a bad No, I mean, I know it's a very bad problem in New Haven. Um, I'm just, when you say, you know, we become conscious and so forth and so on, as long as I've been alive, lead has been a problem. So I'm a little concerned that the EPA is just catching up, so to speak, and oh, it took, that it took Detroit or so. I mean, this is a this is a rocket science. This is what you guys get paid for. This is what you're supposed to be planning and helping mm -hmm. people for. So it's kind of weird to hear you say that you know we've raised the consciousness. This has been a problem for decades. It, it absolutely, and I and I acknowledge that it's been a problem for decades. So where's the EPA then? So the EPA is. Um, refocusing our priorities. Again, this is about the different levels of government 
some of the best work on lead removal has been done at the local level. Some of it has been done at the state level with state level funding. Um, look at the city of Boston through the Massachusetts legislature. They just put forward an initiative to do testing in schools. That wasn't the EPA. So I agree with you. What we're trying to do now is look at what EPA authorities we have, what infrastructure dollars we have, and focusing on the lead, making lead a priority. So um, not to say that there were people who weren't paying attention to it before, but I would say it's now at the highest level of the agency in terms of a priority across all 10 regions of the EPA. Um, so I think that's, a, that's good. I mean, there are many things that compete for attention. Um, we know that our most vulnerable populations, children, particularly in low income settings, can be per permanently um, harmed in their ability to learn and their um, brain development by lead. And so we want to absolutely be 100% be focused on reducing childhood lead exposure. But you've known this, again, for decades, the way you make this sound is that um, you're kind of coming to the rescue now and 